Okay, so for this last talk of I today, we are so happy to welcome two of the most inspiring business thinkers in the world. And like chocolate or mountains, they are our national pride in Switzerland. Professor Yves Pinger and Dr. Alex Osterwalder are considered mastermind among business strategists. Their tools have been used by numerous companies such as P&G, Amazon, Google, Bosch, Tesla, well, all of them. Uh, and they are true legends in entrepreneurship. Just a number. More than a hundred and of thousands of people follow them on Twitter and they write business books. <laughs> they are ranked number four of the top uh, 50 management at the uh, Thinker 50. And this is the Oscars of management. Together, they've created 15 years ago uh, the business model canvas that you all know, this canvas. And they wrote this book, Business Model Generation, uh, that, which sold more than uh, 1.5 million of copies in 30 languages, again, for a business book. It is one of the most influential book in business, and every young entrepreneur or startup or even designers has read it. Um, they are also the creators of the value proposition and the proposition canvas. This book is amazing. Flip the book, it's even more amazing. And uh, in, in uh, April this year, during COVID lockdown, they have published their new book, which is The Invincible Company, which is amazing and also beautiful. And I'm a designer, so I can recognize beauty. Uh, so yeah, it's jump back to so much of uh, uh, information, stories, and that they're gonna share with you during this talk. So I'm so proud and happy to welcome on this show, uh, Alex Osterwalder and Yves Pinger for the Indianable Company. Big round of applause, please. Yves, Alex, your turn. Yeah, go. Let's go. Let's go. I'm starting. <clears throat> so we are... Very happy with Alex to be online with you today. Uh, let me, and I will try to share with you some talks that we had on this idea of invincible company. We, we could have called also maybe the resilient company. I will explain that a little bit later. As Steph just told you, uh, we started to work together more than 20 years ago now and trying to create some visual tools uh, corresponding to some business concepts. And uh, we created the business model canvas, the first tool that we published uh, 10 years ago now inside this book, uh, Business Model Generation, to map out your business model. Then we came with the value proposition canvas and helping people to design and test your value proposition. Then we switched uh, last year, uh, David Bland with Alex wrote this book, Testing Business ID. The ID was to provide the readers with some techniques uh, for testing and the risking business ideas. We will come back on this issue a little bit later. And this year, we came with the Invincible Company to help people to manage their portfolio and create an, evo an innovation culture. What's an Invincible Company for us? Three characteristics. Invincible companies uh, constantly or at least regularly, frequently reinvent themselves. Second, they are able to compete on superior business model and not only on product and or technology. And finally, they're able to transcend industry boundaries to go away of their traditional sector of activity. And I think, or we think, uh, that those three characteristics is also good for what we could call the resilient company, which is especially uh, of actuality in, during this uh, last six months. And everything started three years ago, in fact, in this uh, small village in Lasage, And we sketched some ideas on this idea of business model portfolio. And I will just briefly explain what's this concept and then we will deal with the topic for today. Uh, in our mind, we have this explore, exploit continuum. If you are a startup, you have an idea uh, and you try, you search the right business model, okay? And it's a design and de uh, testing activity uh, with a lot of back and forth iteration. If you are able to find it, you can launch and you can grow or sustain or survive for an existing company. And this is a, a, a quite messy process if you want. But if you are an existing company, this one is for you. Mainly you execute your existing business model. But 
it also means that maybe you have to deal also with this exploration activity, playing the game of the startups, just for replacing some declining business model or coming with new activity that you could, a uh, uh, new business model that you could create. So we mean that uh, companies need maybe to be ambidextrous. And based on this idea, we wanted to have a visualization of those business models. So we came with two blocks here, one with the different business model that you are searching. So you try to invent, to design, to test. We call that the explore portfolio. And a second portfolio where you can visualize, analyze, assess the existing business model that you would like maybe to improve or sometimes to kill it. We will see that in a few moments. A very quick example, even, even if it's not the main topic for today, as I will explain, this idea of portfolio is the following one. And we will try to illustrate it with the Logitech portfolio. So here you have what we call the return. So it means that you have the most contributing business model on the top and the less contributing at the bottom. Okay, in this case, productivity means a mice, keyboards and so on is the highest contributing business model for Logitech and Smart Home is a very small one. But we can also use this axis for trying to evaluate the risk of those business models, the disruption risk. And so you could consider that gaming and video is very well protected, again, this disruption risk, but maybe smart home could be at risk. And so the idea for the uh, business model here on the left-hand side is to improve, meaning pushing that on the right-hand side, maybe on the top. But there are some other action that you can take on a portfolio. Another action is divers. You can decide and Logitech has decided to dive us last year, life size, which is a video conferencing special system. Another action that you well know for the exec executing or exploitation portfolio is to acquire the existing company. In this case, they have acquired two years ago and last year, SciTech Astro for reinforcing the gaming business model. And last year they have, or two years ago, they have acquired Jaybird and Blue, um, speakers and uh, ear set to reinforce the music. Last year, they have invested in Streamlabs and it seemed that this year they will cry Streamlabs, putting that inside their portfolio. Here, a small video by the CEO of uh, Logicat, Bracken Darrell. It will give us a very nice metaphor or analogy. To explain it, called trees, plants, and seeds. And trees, plants, and seeds was the really, really overly simplistic analogy that virtually any company that's been around for more than 10 years is doing, whether they talk to people in public about it or not. But uh, this was mainly for us internally. So the tree was, the big old tree, which was on its way to, to its deathbed, in my view, it's gonna fall over and turn into lumber, was the PC peripherals business. The, the, the plants could be new businesses, and the seeds would be things we'd try to create that might be new businesses one day. It's really that simple. So we took 75% of the resources out of the plant business, which is piece of the traditional business, okay, on the top here on the, the uh, top right, and to push that in the explore portfolio. We will see that a little bit later. Just an amazing fact about uh, Bracken Darrell. He spends between 40 and 60% of his time on innovation. So I have a question for you, and Steph will launch a poll, how much time does your CEO personally spend on business model every week, last week, for example? And if you are the CEO of your company, how much time do you spend on business innovation, exploration of business model? And so now you have the poll, you can vote 15 seconds, and I, we will show the result, and I will try to comment a little bit. Okay, so how much time your CEO personally spend on innovation every week. Okay, vote, vote, vote. Steph, you can stop and maybe put this on your, okay. So here, less than 10% for 50%, between 10 and 25, 40. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, let me maybe continue. Oops. Yeah. <clears throat> 
Okay, so the question was this one. Look at this. We asked this question to all the masterclass we had with Alex. And last year, he launched a poll on Twitter. And the result was this one. Quite roughly similar to what you have presented here. So 70% spend less than 10% of their time on innovation every week. And only 7% spend more than 50%, such as Brack and Darrell. And so the question, is it possible to have ambidextrous CEOs? Let's show. And this uh, poll last year has been confirmed last week because Alex launched a poll with a question. Do you agree that the leaders in your company have no clue about how to manage innovation? And the result is spectacular, okay? 40% agree or strongly agree that leaders in their company have no clue about how to manage. That's the reason why we came with a suggestion that I will not uh, comment too much today, is CEO is fine to address and to manage the present of the company, the execution portfolio. And maybe we need to have a chief entrepreneur or chief corporate entrepreneur with the same power to address the future of the company, the exploration. Stop there. So the tool that we developed inside this book is first the portfolio manager, the portfolio map I presented very uh, rapidly. We came also with some design techniques that we call design patterns or business model patterns. Uh, I will come back on this a little bit later. And also we wanted to address how to create an innovation culture inside your company. And we use a tool we developed a long time ago with Dave Gray called the culture map. Today, we will focus mainly on business model patterns. What does it mean? It means the agenda for today, Alex will present you the business model design and business model testing, a couple of ideas that we had on this topic. Then he continue and he will show you and illustrate some invent patterns with some exercise that you will do. And finally, at the end, I will come on this idea of shift pattern uh, to help people to transform existing business model. And Alex will take, I will just uh, stop sharing here. And Alex will continue. Okay, so as you've seen with the intro by, by Eve, you know, um, takes more than just in quotes, tools and processes to actually get innovation right. But nevertheless, we believe that um, innovation is in this whole professionalization phase where we can improve the way how we work. And you know, at this conference, you have seen quite a bit of that already. But at the same time, you know, besides the bottom up, we need the top down. If leaders don't create the, the conditions for success, nothing will happen. So let's look at the process now that Eve started to talk about this idea of inventing new business models and value propositions or improving. There are actually two phases to this or two cycles, if you want, and you, you go through them all the time. Okay, so the first phase is business design which has ideation, business prototyping, assessment, where you think about how you create value for customers and how you create value for your business. And we'll zoom into that a little bit today. Topic not so much for today is how do you test? Uh, Steph showed the book, one of the books that we wrote, Testing Business Ideas, or Eve mentioned that one. Um, this whole idea of hypothesizing what needs to be true for ideas to work and then experiment. But that's not the core topic for today. Actually, what we will show today is the potential you have here with business model design. So how can you compete beyond just in quotes products and services? Okay, that's what we're going to look at a little bit today. And we're going to see how to better decide. So two tools, we'll just look at one today and we'll look at the patterns there. The business small canvas, I'll do a quick repetition for those of you who don't know it. This is all about making explicit how you create, deliver, and capture value. But then there's the second tool, which is the value proposition canvas, which makes explicit how you create value for customers. And I want you to keep this in mind. Even with the best product or service, you can actually still fail if you don't have the right business model. Think of Nespresso, an example we use a lot, with the same product, the Nespresso machines and the pods, they almost went bankrupt. They had to find a better business model. So if you're just focusing on products and services, you're not doing your job right, okay? Product, services, and price is part of your job, but the rest of the job is to figure out the right business model, okay? If you don't do that, well, you're not doing the best you can. So let me just quickly do a repetition for those of you who haven't seen the business small canvas yet. So it has nine building blocks. 
First one is how do you create value for, for your customers? So value proposition, customer segments. And then you need to ask, what do I need to have? And what do I need to do to create value? So key resources is what you need to have. Factories, brand, etc. Key activities is what you do. And the partners is who you work together with. Once you figured that out, that gives you the cost structure, okay? This is what we call the backstage. Everything you need to kind of do behind the curtain to get your business going. Then we have the front stage. How do you reach customers with the channels? And what kind of relationship do you establish once you're working with customers? And then how do you capture value from that? Okay, nine building blocks. So we're not going to go deeper into this because we actually want to go in a more sophisticated way into business model patterns. But let me do a little quick exercise with you to see how good you actually are with the business small canvas. So we're going to use the TED conference as an example. So one of our friends, friends um, Bruno Gisani, um, he's helping here with the TED conference and he's talking about the conference and we'll see also about the shift from conference to video. But we want to fo focus on the very first business model, which was a conference model. And we want you, since it's the end of the day, you need to do some work so you stay full, fully energized. And we can see you. We can see you on the screen. So if you're not working, we're going to stop right here, right now. Okay? So I want to see everybody working. And in addition, if you're not working, it means you don't care about business models. You don't care about your company or your work. So let me give you the TED conference building blocks for the conference business. Okay? Only the conference business. And you're going to have to map it out. So value proposition, TED conferences. At the beginning, right, it was only for invited people, invite only uh, influencers. So I'm going to give you the building blocks here. So we have on the left-hand side, all of the building blocks of the TED conference. You have numbers here. So you need to put the right letter with the right number, okay, to figure out which building block goes into which number. So all I want you to do is write down on a piece of paper the correct sequence of letters, okay? Which one goes with one, which one goes with two, which one goes with three. Once you have that, only when you're finished, you type it into the chat window, okay? So we're going to give you two minutes to do this exercise. Let's see who gets it right first. Let's get started, okay? Anybody who's not working doesn't give a damn about their business model and will most likely fail in the future. So you better get working. Okay, let's see who gets it right first. So when you have the full sequence, you can type it into the chat window, but only when you have the full sequence. And then we'll see who gets it right. The first person who gets it right will be called master of the workshop today. Okay, so Fabrice here, D-F-A-C-E-B. Okay, I can see people working, that's great. Eve, Marcus, Alex, everybody working, that's great. Another D-F-A-C-E-B. Karsten got it too, okay. Don't worry if you're not done yet. We still have 40 seconds. No time pressure. Okay, slight variation there from Emily, D-F-A-C-E-B. Oh, no, yeah, good. Okay, the only thing that's missing is a little bit of background music, right? I won't start singing because otherwise everybody will log out, turn off the sound. Okay, I think that's good. We got quite a few answers here. Five seconds left. The correct answer was, as many of you got right, this was an easy exercise, D-F-A-C-E-B. We'll have a more complicated exercise afterwards. We started simple, right? Okay, so let's look at this. Of course, DFAECB was right. So conference fees is the revenue stream. 
the channel, it was at the beginning personal invitations. You couldn't just go. Even if you paid, you had to get invited to the TED conference. So it was a very privileged relationship. You had to be part of the network. And then, of course, in the key resources, you know, we could have put a couple of things. We kept it simple. You have staff and curators. In the key activities, we had the staging of the conferences, and that leads to the conference logistics talks. And as key partners, we put TED speakers. Now, first thing, granularity. We could have been a lot more granular, but we wanted to keep it relatively straightforward here. What we could add to this, of course, is the second part of the business model when they started out. They needed sponsors. What's the value proposition to sponsors? Visibility and the revenue stream is sponsoring. Okay, so a lot of people use the business model canvas now around the world, literally millions, to map out their business model. But when you start out with a new idea or you improve an idea, you need to make sure that your vision is not a hallucination. So what looks great on paper or in a business plan might actually not work. So you don't actually know at the beginning the difference between a good idea or a bad idea. You don't know. So here I'm quoting Steve Blank, the inventor of the whole lean startup movement with customer development. So the question to you is, very quickly, we'll do a poll here. How many business ideas do you think you need to invest in? Okay, so invest in not just ideas, but projects to create a mega success. How many projects would you need to invest in, small amounts of money, to create a really, really big success? Okay, so think you're, you're at Logitech or at Nestle. Do you invest in what? Um, 10 projects, 25, 50, 100, 250, or 1,000, okay? And um, let's take the, the yardstick of 100,000 Swiss francs or dollars. You'd have to invest 100,000 Swiss francs. How many projects would you invest in? So let's please vote. Let's see what comes out of this. And those of you who know the answer, it's kind of easy. You might have been at some of our talks. Okay, do we have enough votes? Then we can switch to the results. We can put up the results. Okay, so most of you say 100 projects, but the correct answer is actually, let's see, the correct answer is 250. Why is that? Let me show you. Because if you look at early stage venture capital, the you know, investment of small amounts of money in projects early on, you can actually see that six out of 10 projects, they lose money, okay, they're failures. Three out of 10, they make some money, only four out of a thousand, they become big successes, okay? That is the law of venture capital, that very few investments actually make up for the anti-return. What does that mean? If we go map it back to the numbers, we have 250 projects, 162 fail, 87 some success, only one out of 250 is a big success. It means you can't pick the winner. So in innovation, many of you will fail and that's okay. The challenge is of course, kill those projects early and throw them away. So if you're in a smaller company, obviously it's not 250 projects, it's maybe 10, but you can't pick the winner in innovation, in growth innovation, in efficiency innovation, making better processes for your Amazon warehouse, of course you can pick the winner. But for new business models, new value propositions, you can't. But the good news is, well, failure can be the beginning of something beautiful. So we can improve the process. And of course, we need to kill the projects that are not successful. And this is an art that we won't go into deep here, but you need to be able to kill projects. So just very briefly, before we go into business small patterns, very quickly on this idea of testing and decreasing the risk of innovation. This is now a profession. We can even measure the reduction of risk and uncertainty. It's not just this fuzzy lean startup concept. We can actually start to take these big ideas and break them down into smaller pieces that you can test. And here's a mistake that many of you are making. You probably think, if you're an engineer, put your hand up. Let me see. Put, put your hands up if you're an engineer. Any engineers in the room? Okay. What do engineers traditionally do? They build stuff. So they build stuff to test things. But you don't need to build stuff to test things necessarily. What you need to actually ask is what needs to be true for this idea to work? And you will have a ton of hypothesis. A hypothesis that the customer has this problem. A hypothesis that they have the budget. A hypothesis that they will pay for it. 
and a hypothesis that your value proposition creates value. These are the things you need to test, okay? And for that reason, we said, okay, we will write a book about the topic. And one of the big things is here, you want to admit that when you start out, you actually have no clue if your idea is gonna work. So the risk of failure is big. So what do you do when the risk of failure is big? You don't build something, you test with the cheapest possible ways of doing things. For example, a customer discovery interview before building something, right? Even before building whatever, like a landing page. Now we saw that not that many people were good at this process. So before execution, they did testing, but what they didn't really do well is a systematic approach with a whole variety of experiments. So we wrote this book with 44 experiments, a library of 44 experiments. So you can actually do these two phases of testing, which we take from Steve Blank's work, customer discovery, when you don't know yet what's gonna work. So you do very cheap and quick tests, like interviews, like card sort, uh, like speedboat. I won't go into details here. And only afterwards, do you do customer validation where you actually build stuff? So building is not the first thing you do because it's a waste of time, energy, and money. Too many people start too quickly with building. This is actually the biggest and most expensive mistake we see in many, many companies. Then people say, Alex, but you know, we actually need to spend a million dollars on a prototype. Then I say, well, that's a reason more to do good customer discovery before you build anything. So testing again is not the topic here, but I just want to show you the things you need to ask yourself in an experiment. Customer interview, simple experiment, but the, you can actually start to understand the cost of an experiment. So customer interviews are cheap, okay? Setup time is fast, runtime is fast, but the problem is the evidence strength is relatively low. What people say and what they do is not the same thing. Oh, are you gonna go to the gym, you know, the next five days if I give you this cool device? Oh, of course I will. Will I ever do it? Of course not. I don't have time. I have to run a conference here, right? During COVID-19 online. So you need to ask yourself, what's the right experiment at the right time? Again, not the topic today. So I'm gonna do the topic of today, which we really think we can help you with a breakthrough and the rest you can go um, buy our books and, and have a look at it. So what Eve already addressed with this idea of business model patterns that you can actually create better business models to outcompete others. Because let me repeat myself, it's not enough anymore to compete on great products, great services at a great price. Nobody wants to buy a crappy product, right? Who have you ever wanted to go buy a crappy product? Nobody anymore. You can even check online what's good, what's bad. So today having a great product is just a matter of survival. A matter of staying ahead is being extremely good at business design beyond product design, okay? So you need to add it. Of course, product design is core, but it's not enough to succeed anymore. So Roger Martin, who actually pushed this idea of, of uh, business design, used to be number one business thinker of the world. I think he's number two now. So he likes to say, you need to become designers as business people or designers need to become business people, right? So what do we mean with this? Let's take this idea that comes from design. We took it from architecture, from this whole idea of, of um, arch architecture prototypes um, patterns. In business, these are repeatable configurations of the business model building blocks to strengthen your idea. So two types of patterns, one in invent and one in improve. Here, we're trying to create new business models around a new idea. And here we're trying to, many of you work in existing companies, improve existing business models. We call this shift patterns. Okay, let me go into the first one. What do we mean with this here? We mean the improvement of an idea by applying a business model pattern, something that will make your business model around your technology, around your product, around your service, stronger and better. And we created an entire library of patterns. We have some that are in the front stage, more customer related. We have some that are more on the backstage, more infrastructure related, you know, um, activities, resources. And we have some patterns that are related to profit formula, to how to make more money and spend less. Now, let me make it concrete. So this is a little bit conceptual. Let's go to the concrete stuff. 
type into the chat window what these three business models have in common. Amazon Web Services, Dyson, or Waze. Okay, Amazon Web Services, you know what that is. Dyson, you know, with the, the home appliances, they start with the vacuum cleaners and Waze, the navigation app. What do their business models have in common? Quickly type, it, type into the chat window. What do they have in common? Not so easy, right? They have a part of their pattern in common. They have a similar pattern. Let's see if anybody figures it out. I'll just give you 20 seconds. Disruption could be, it's not what we're looking for. On-demand subscription, yeah, Dyson, I didn't, I didn't see a Dyson subscription yet. Freemium. Okay, what they have in common is all three, in a different way, created a resource castle they created resources that are very difficult to copy. Okay, let me take the simplest one. We'll look at, we'll look at Dyson, most straightforward. Other twos have actually the, a similar principle. So here's what we call a pattern where we have three building blocks. Hard to copy resource, the first building block. We need to invest money into that resource and that will allow us to come up with a value proposition that is protected because the resource is protected. Okay, that's the pattern. Let's look at an example here, Dyson. It's the most straightforward. It's a very simple pattern if you want because we're talking about patents. So now another thing here, just quick side remark, Dyson is a company that understands failure and success extremely well. They know they need to try out a lot until they succeed. But what's powerful actually is not just the product, but the pattern behind this. So what they understood is if they come up with great intellectual property and patents that protect their devices, guess what? They can start to create premium consumer appliances like these vacuum cleaners that they will be able to send, sell to a high-end market at a premium price, okay? That's what they do. What is part of this pattern, here's where we go beyond the product, is in terms of key resources, they need to, key activities, they need to spend a ton of money into R&D, actually six times more, six times more than any of their competitors, which leads to a higher R&D cost. But they make that bet because they know this pattern will keep them ahead. Now you'll say, well, that's trivial, but they were the only ones to do it in household home appliances, okay? Pretty powerful. So what did that lead to? To an immense kind of scaling of home appliances they sold over 100 million machines until um, 2017. So now let's look at one that you need to do, you need to work on because I talked too long. So front stage disruption, we're going to look at channel kings. So here we're talking about a business that radically changed how to reach and acquire a large number of customers. The pattern here is very simple a value proposition that you're selling to a customer segment, but you're going to disrupt the intermediaries and you're going to sell through an innovative direct channel. Okay. So direct to consumer, if you want. And the examples here that you might know, Dollar Shave Club, Tupperware, and Espresso, we're going to zoom into the Dollar Shave Club. We're going to look at that, that pattern. Now, let me give you a little bit more help with this pattern. So the secondary aspects of a disintermediator so you can understand how it works. So the first one is here that we have a direct relationship with the customer and we capture the full revenue because there's no more intermediary, no more um, um, retailer that takes some money. But of course, for that to work, we need to do something in the backstage. We need to replace this direct access, what the retailers used to give us by innovative marketing and selling with an incredibly powerful own brand. This, of course, means a lot more money spent on acquisition because now you need to reach the customer. You don't have the retailer anymore. So let me give you an example. You might have heard of Dollar Shave Club. So this is the example we're going to use, maybe a little bit more attractive for the men than for the women. I see a couple of you don't need one. You're very bearded there, Eve Inozales. So you don't need the razors. But the case still works. Bad Swiss joke. Sorry for Hi, that. I'm Mike, founder of DollarShaveClub.com. What is DollarShaveClub.com? Well, for a dollar a month, we send high-quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great.
Each razor has stainless steel blades and aloe vera lubricating strip and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and 10 blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up! Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are gonna ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandro, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're gonna stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are dollarshaveclub.com and the party is on. Okay, so the point here is, why do we use this example? Because it's actually, if you want inferior technology, the razors are probably not as sophisticated. Now, task for you is you got two minutes to map out the business model of Dollar Shave Club, and you're going to use the pattern. So you're only going to map out the aspects of the pattern. Okay, so we're going to give you the first, okay, Affordables Men's Shavings Products, selling it to the mass market, and the rest of the building blocks, we're going to give you based on the pattern and the little video that you have seen. Okay, so let's get going and see slightly a little bit harder if you can get this one right. Let's go. Timer on. There we go. Let's see who's going to get it right this time. Okay, see, this is a little bit harder. I can see some of you. Okay, I don't think I've seen the correct version yet. Okay, we have a variety here. Okay, five more seconds. I see most of you are done. Okay, so the correct version was C, D, A, E, B, F. Okay, C, D, A, E, B, F. Who got it right? So online store and viral videos is the channel Okay, so they needed to replace the access to retailers through a direct channel that is a direct relationship. That's the type of relationship they established. Customized subscriptions is, of course, the revenue stream. Innovative marketing is the key activity. Innovative marketing means what? Creating viral videos again and again and again. And, of course, the brand as a key resource. And we added one more, the e-commerce commerce store. So around your products, you need to think of these business model patterns. In this case, this pattern actually led to a 69% retention rate, which was incredibly high in this particular domain, okay? So very powerful business model. Now in these patterns, we actually have sub patterns. Here you've seen uh, one of the two, and we add for every one of these trigger questions so you can come up with better business models. And what's really important here is when you're working on a product or service and the related business model, you can ask yourself an assess assessment question, meaning is this 
a very good, does it score well on this pattern or does it score not so well? And you can do that across all of these patterns so you can start to assess the design of your business model, okay? Not just the product or service. Let me repeat, the success is in the business model. So you can start to assess the design, which doesn't mean you shouldn't test it because the design can be great, but customers can still hate it. And here is where I'm going to hand over to Eve. I think I took a little bit of time. So Eve, floor is yours. Yes. Okay. So <clears throat> we'll try to finish in a few moments. The idea was uh, to deal with this idea of shift pattern, mean trying to transform an existing business model. Why? Uh, because, uh, oops. Uh, as Rita Magrot say here, the idea is to adopt a transient strategy, to be ready to change regularly your business model, to adapt to your environment or to grow. <clears throat> and so the idea compared with the diagram we, we used at the beginning, the idea is to deal with this idea of improving existing business model. So in a uh, shift pattern, we have an existing business model and we try to apply this pattern for creating a new business model and in the same way as we have done it for the uh, invent pattern we came with a library uh, where the the pattern is mainly based on an epicenter a block inside of the business model canvas value proposition shift is from product to service uh, from low tech to high tech sometimes it's the reverse from high tech to low tech think for example nintendo Wii. We had also some uh, front stage uh, driven shift from uh, niche to mass market, from B2B to B2C, or from B2C to B2B. We had also some backstage driven shift based on the resources, on the activity, the partnership that you could have. And finally, some uh, profit formula driven shift that I will not explore today. And I will mainly focus on one of the front stage driven shift, so a radical shift the transformation of your business model of who is targeted and how products and services could be delivered. And I will focus on what we call from niche market to mass market. So it means that we have a niche value proposition for a niche market, small market, high price, high revenue. And we, we could switch towards a mass market with maybe a low price, but higher volume revenue and using a different channel and using maybe some different backstage such as different activities or different resources, you need to acquire to be able to adopt this mass market. And uh, for each of those pattern, shift pattern, we have also, as uh, we had for the invent pattern, some strategic reflection or uh, trigger questions if you want. And we will, and it will be our last exercise for today, we will try to illustrate when Ted decided to shift from niche conference to streaming video for all in 2006. And you, I'm sure that you have watched those, uh, some of those uh, Ted talks. And I will ask you to change or how they change their existing business model to adapt it to video streaming. You remember with Alex, you briefly map out the uh, existing business model, the conferences. I will give you the different blocks here, Ted Toll, Ted Toll's production and so on. And the same question we had so far. So the idea is to write on the full sequence of the seven letters matching their numbers. And you have two minutes, so let's go to match and write it. And as soon as you have the seven letters, you can type it in the chat window. So in gray, you have the existing one, in yellow, the new one. Okay, one, one minute. No answer yet.
So the gray is for the conference, the yellow is for the TED Talks. I think it's time to wake up. It will be the last one, so we will finish in two minutes. Okay, first, Fabrice. Marcus. It's good. People are still working, huh? So. Yeah, yeah, you can see it. Yeah. Some, some gave up. Some, some. Uh, it, it's been two days of a two day, you know? <laughs> Okay, let's see. I think it's quite uh, easy when you, you will see the solution. The TED Talks is what you offer, it's your value proposition. Global audience, you are a member of this audience, large audience worldwide. And then they had to adopt a new uh, channel for reaching this one because you can watch those uh, videos and TED Talks on the uh, TED.com. Uh, TED then uh, revenue, That's, keep that in mind, it's free streaming. Sometimes it's free, okay, you know, Google is free, but somebody else maybe could pay something. But why they came with a new business model, so sophisticated, but with a free streaming. Tetos production, because they had to came to create a new activity that they had never done before for the conferences and the mass marketing and not the niche marketing with invited only uh, influencers. And finally, they had to overdevelop and to adopt their key resources, a huge IT infrastructure with some collaboration with YouTube and so on. Okay, so what we can see here, they have in fact adopted a pattern from niche to mass market for creating this one with, you can see the TED Talk, the uh, global audience, the streaming, keeping the two, gray is the conference, yellow is the new one. They were quite successful, 3,000 TED Talks online, more than 50 billion views uh, two years ago, or one and a half years ago. But we still need to explain this one, why they kept this for free and they built this sophisticated business model. What you can observe with this audience they had here, it means that it's possible to consider this audience as a resource. So it means that this people could be interested and ready to pay more. And it's very visible. No, you have to pay 10,000, 25,000, and 250,000 if, if you want to be a member for five years. So a huge amount of money. And with this one, they were able to increase their total annual revenue, reaching something like 70 million. So what we have done today, I briefly explained the tool very quickly. We focus on those two kinds of patterns invent patterns, shift patterns, and we didn't cover this one. Just before ending, you know, we have seen, especially during this crisis, a lot of prediction. And we know, we know prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future. And we have seen a lot of them. A lot of people, business will be the same as before. Bill, business will never be the same and so on. So a lot of prediction, but do not forget. When we have prediction, we have also some special kind of consultant if you want, sorry. Alors Jean-Fabien, vous êtes voyant, n'est-ce pas Exactement, je prévois l'avenir. Et celle-là Hein Tu l'as prévu celle-là <rire> Voyez, je vais devoir. Pas besoin de long débat pour démystifier le charlatan. <rire> so, thank you. Ready for question. So, first of all, a big round of applause. You can unmute yourself. It was amazing. Uh, really, thank you for that. So um, the first question, I think, comes from Remy. And for the other ones, don't be shy. Please write your question on the chat, and we're going to give you the, the speech. Remy. Well, uh, can you hear me well? Is it working well? Yep, perfect. Well, Eve, Alex, uh, it's an honor to talk to you. Uh, thank you for all your work these last decades. That's probably your work, which led me to my current work and what I'm doing all day long. So thank you very much. Um, this final book is great. Uh, it's finally linking all you've been talking for more than 10 years now about uh, how companies operate in order to create, generate, and capture value, and how we deliver before all value, and how we can validate ID and go from diminishing systematically the risk. And now I will say there's a next stage, which is we, we know, uh, I know, and you probably know as well, for operating with big corporations that they are using 
traditional and conventional finance piloting tools and ways to measure the efficient value and current margin and low-term profits? And how could we do in order for the chief of the one with the powers to integrate this notion of uh, uh, innovation evaluation and innovation uh, value description, even if the product is not here yet, you know, but uh, to better integrate it in order to make it less an experiment and more a day-to-day -day current uh, activity integrated little by little into the group philosophy. I don't know if the question is clear and uh, thank you in advance for your answer. Alex, maybe yeah. you can start and I will try to... Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I'll, I'll share an anecdote. So, I mean, you've seen the numbers. We, we asked the question, right? You know, how many CEOs, you know, how much time do CEOs spend on innovation? And it's still too little. But what's encouraging is it's changing. And, you know, we try to make that happen. So before COVID-19, before the lockdown, I was with one of the biggest financial institutions in Europe with the CEO and his leadership team. And I talked about the ratio, right, 250 to 1 to show you can't pick the winner. And then, you know, gave the solution that kind of that you need to start to manage your portfolio and that you can measure it. So if, you know, we try to keep it in very simple worlds, it words, there's two worlds, exploit and explore. And in explore, the ratio is different, the culture is different, and we show that. We don't try to make it complicated. We don't try to sell consulting. So, oh, you know, you need us to do this and that. So it is encouraging because, you know, the guy walked out of the meeting and he said, oh, wow, we really need more portfolio management. And I have a couple of stories like this to share. You know, it, it's just that right now, they, you know, until now, they didn't always really know how to do it. Some did. Bracken Darrell is an example. Many of them didn't because they grew up in a different world. The, the world where the disruption is not as big. However, you know, with COVID-19, we all got disrupted. So, you know, with all the negative side effects, the probably positive thing is that it has really shaken everybody to the core because they realized, wow, the system is very fragile. And that's why Eve also mentioned we could have called our book The Resilient Organization because companies that do this are actually, you know, many of them thriving today because they're ready for uncertainty. With exceptions, if you're in the travel industry, pretty tough. But if you take Airbnb, they are actually pretty, you know, getting through this pretty well. Of course, they had to manage the core. They had to let go, unfortunately, of people. But they are very um, at ease with this kind of system. So things are going to change very rapidly. And I'm actually pretty positive, even if the numbers still look pretty bad. Eve? Maybe we could add something. Uh, as you mentioned, for the exploit portfolio, we have all the uh, numbers, uh, KPIs, and uh, the different yeah. measures uh, for the regular uh, business, as you know. For the exploration, as Alex mentioned, the culture is different, means also the measures, the metrics have to be different. And so that's the reason why we developed a, a kind of innovation metric system in which we are much less focus on customer satisfaction, finance, and so on, but much more on the expected return and the risk or uncertainty. So the idea is to measure how you have reduced the risk for the different business model in your explore portfolio. And so based on this one, we can plot the different pieces using the risk uncertainty, the expected return, the learning velocity uh, for the different projects you have, the cost of the different hypothesis, uh, uh, the different experience you manage. And this kind of innovation metrics, we didn't mention that today, but we have developed a kind of conceptual framework for helping people to uh, define those metrics to measure the different business model inside their export portfolio. Alex? And just, yeah, just one thing to one thing yeah. to add, you know, so why did we come up with metrics? Because, you know, I think the innovation community has this, um, it may be in general, the, the business community, the innovators, they use buzzwords that CEOs couldn't care less about, you know, lean startup, sprint this, sprint that, like CEOs, like their head explodes when they hear that and they say, look, I, I think you're just going to do another merger and acquisition. So bad Swiss humor, but you know, it, it does turn out we, we should learn how to speak the language of leaders, which is why we came up with a business portfolio map. And we need to use the word risk and uncertainty and return. If we don't use that, there's no chance innovation is ever going to make it into the strategy of companies, right? So I think we need to take ourselves by our own hair and, you know, say, what, what, what do we need to change instead of blaming the leaders? How do we help leaders? Okay. So it's too easy to say, oh, it's their fault. No, it's not. 
it's our fault just as much because if we can't make it happen, it's our fault just as much. Okay, so let's start stop blaming others and try to help and, and create this into a real partnership. So I'm being provocative deliberately because I think we're part of the problem just as much as we are part of the solution. Amazing, thank you. Uh, Jan has a has a question. Jan, hey you guys. Um, yeah, um, I'm really glad to have you uh, here today. It's um, super talk and uh, such an interesting topic. Um, just to um, uh, jump on what you just said, Alex, and what you've said at the beginning, you were talking about a CEO that or some kind of a, a chief position that was leading the uh, innovation side and that would kind of uh, uh, produce the future business that would then cannibalize uh, with the existing uh, portfolio. But um, you say it could be two person, but um, Every case is where you say it's a success. Most of the time, it's a single person that is able to, uh, I would say, uh, counterbalance you know, the pressure from the existing business, having uh, uh, politics, existing portfolio, uh, jobs at stakes, economies uh, at stakes, and having someone that comes in with new ideas and pushing and say, look, stop pushing that and so on and so on. Um, I see that doable as a single person job because you know, being a business industrialist, you can in a certain way prioritize. But do you see really a possibility where you could have the two positions coexisting together and working together hand in hand with yeah. their own pressure and their own business priorities? It's clear that I think it's what we wanted to express. You could have one people doing both. And you have seen maybe you know, Bracken Darrell, he was spending maybe 50% of his time on the innovation. So you could have. What we have seen is very few companies have this kind of one people doing both. So it was a suggestion to say, maybe we could consider to have uh, two different ones. And we have seen some company having implemented this kind of things. We have, we have one good example in our mind, Ping An, which is an insurance company. They have two different, one CEOs and what they call co-CEOs, but one for the present, the exploitation, and one for exploration. And so I think maybe five, three years ago when we suggested that they say, oh, Alex, and you, you are crazy. It's impossible to have two people for doing this kind of job. And I know, I think in the last couple of uh, month, uh, years, we have seen some companies, Lego or here in Switzerland, maybe uh, uh, some company that we have, uh, Laura Star, where we have co-CEOs, co-direction. It's clear when you have two people, you need to have some balancing of uh, mechanism. We had what we call also the chief uh, ambassador to be able to manage this diplomacy between the two different people. We could have also on top the, the board or the chairman. So I think it's possible to come with some different mechanism to be able to take the best of the two people, one in charge of the future, one of, in charge of the present. Alex. Yeah, I would almost not frame it in terms of people, but in terms of the problem. So the problem is actually that innovation doesn't have enough power. So the solution means we need to give innovation power. That is either the CEO himself or herself or somebody at the same level. And as you've said, there are starting, we are starting to see examples where the co-CEO, Jessica Tan, is a great example where that happens. So I don't care if it's the CEO or if it's the chief entrepreneur, the power needs to be at the very top. And I wouldn't even blame leadership. The, the people I blame are the boards of companies, the board of Nestle, the board of whatever, that they are not doing their job holding the companies responsible to actually you know, give innovation power. Now, this is going to happen um, I hope there's not that many victims in the process because companies that don't start to do this, they will start to disappear. The pharmaceutical industry and the banking industry is going to be a big victim of change. And hopefully some of the Swiss companies to be a little bit nationalistic since, you know, other countries are. <laughs> I hope they can survive. But, you know, um, that is a question of the boards holding the leaders responsible for thinking long term and not just in terms of words, but in terms of actions. There's a lot of talk. There's, a, there's very... There's not enough, let me put it this way, there's not enough informed action. There's a lot of money, but there's not a lot of informed action yet. Yeah, maybe we have a question here quite interesting. What if I don't want to grow 10, 50 times? What if I just want a business model that works for my SME as its current size? Do I need to care about exploration at all? Alex, you can start. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's a great question in the sense that 
you know, you don't have to grow if you don't want to. If you think you can actually survive without growing, you know, be my guest. I think that's super important. The problem is when you think you have a stable business model and don't you realize you're getting disrupted. So sometimes it's not even about growth. It's just about survival. So I know a couple of CEOs of small and medium-sized companies they say innovation is a matter of survival for them, not a question of growth. So just to stay alive, you actually need to innovate. Now, if you want to grow or not, that needs to be a decision. I fully agree. And I don't think the silicon style, you know, um, absolute growth needs to be a must. Actually, it leads, it leads to excess. Uber, you know, in the day, uh, WeWorks, those are all excesses that, that are not very good. Um, but, you know, you do need to innovate just to stay alive. It's, it's getting harder and harder to stay alive with the same business model for longer than three years. Even I like to say business models expire like a yogurt in the fridge. You don't want to consume an expired yogurt. Not very good. Thank you so much. I think that was, uh, th that was the best ending ever for, for, for this talk. Uh, are you going to be part of the networking sessions? I can hang out a little bit, but not too long. Amazing, amazing. So hurry up and ask your questions to Alex and Eve. Thank you so much for all, all of this wisdom. It was amazing. Thank you for being part of I today. Welcome. Amazing. Uh, before before we, we wrap up, I just want to share a couple of things with you. So let me share my screen. So. As you know, I today was supposed to be uh, an event in person uh, before COVID, and it was supposed to have uh, actually the masterclasses with uh, even Alex in Lausanne and the masterclass, uh, the masterclass of Design Sprint with Jake Knapp also. We kept this format, so we split the event in two. That was the virtual part of I today, and we're going to have the masterclasses in 2021 in February. So Jake, uh, February 8th, and even Alex, February 9th. Touch wood, uh, hopefully COVID will be gone by then, or we're gonna have a good, uh, good treatments or, or yeah. Uh, but uh, this is really gonna be amazing and really, really uh, crazy event. Uh, I wanted to thank you all for being here with us during I today. Uh, that's actually, again, Google Analytics from, uh, from, uh, from these two days. You guys were coming from all around the world. I don't know who is that person in the, what, Galapagos Island? <laughs> there was one person <laughs> in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, uh, one person in Iceland also. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Even if you couldn't make it live, some of you, you had to, you, you're going to have the replays. It was amazing. Uh, I want to thank so much all the speakers. You can unmute yourself, and I would like a big round of applause for Thomas Wiesel, Katie Swindler, Paul Watson, Surya Vanka, Kai Halley, Jake Knapp, Mark Gruber, Rama Diallo, Jonas von Lanton, Leila von Alvensleben, Eve Pinger, and of course, Alex Osterwalder. <laughs> And I would like to thank so much our partners who made this possible. EPFL University, of course, the state of Vaux, Aptitude and Knowledge Expert. Check them out. They are amazing. Le Ton, uh, Le Ton newspaper, cartoon base for all the super nice drawing and sketching. It was really amazing to have this live. And Mural uh, for the great talk of Leila and uh, all the visibility. I would like to thank so much the very small team who managed to put that event together, especially uh, Egle, of course, Julien. Uh, who was at the technique, uh, Paul, uh, who was uh, activating uh, the crowd with Sabrina and who was also ho uh, hosting the Remo, and uh, Orlan for everything she did for uh, the marketing, the promotion, and everything. Thank you so much, guys, and let's meet uh, in two minutes in the Remo. <laughs>